over to you. Take it away. Thank you so very much, Maren, and thank you very much for everyone for for joining us here in what is my evening and um, and it'll be morning and middle of the day and everything. So, so yes, hello. I am Sarah Lambert and I'm speaking to you today from the land of the Boon people of the Kulin Nations in what is also known as Melbourne in Australia. And I'm really happy to see many people online today who I have met and extend a special welcome to those of you I haven't yet had the pleasure of meeting. So I've recently finished and submitted a PhD thesis on open education and social justice. So that is my area of research. And this presentation is uh, a piece of um, um, relates to that topic. And yeah, submitting a PhD, um, doing a PhD, submitting a thesis is a pretty big deal for me as a first in family learner to attend, u attend uni and was brought up by a single mum. She didn't get that kind of educational opportunity, and um, and so I have you know kids who um, have had a different opportunities too. Um, some good, some bad, and so I would say as a family we've done pretty good, but not without a fight. And um, why? participation to education and reducing gender-based stereotyping and oppression for men and for women, for my sons, for my mother um, and myself. These are two things I'm really passionate about as a result of many events in my personal and family history and work life. And so I wanted to just give you um, some of that background to understand where I'm coming from and, and why this uh, thesis journey and this research you know, is important and why widening participation to education um, um, makes a difference as it has for me and um, it is a big thing. So in terms of my own personal learning journey, I'm currently grappling with social and educational theory uh, for the last few years here and open education and social justice have a lot of theoretical influences so that's probably something to do with it. And so I'm looking forward to some virtual um, comments and conversation today and afterwards too via uh, a Google Doc which I have set up. Uh, as I explore the following question, where is the theory of online learning that includes non-privileged learners? And so um, just to reiterate, I definitely will be time to take some comments and um, in the chat here, but um, short things, I think, with the time constraints. But for longer comments, contributions, ideas, questions, sharing, I really encourage people to just dump comments into the Google Doc at um, tinyurl.com slash ODL model. So yes, where is the theory of online learning that includes non-privileged learners? So this is the question that um, this current piece of research um, ended up addressing. And so rather than um, worrying too much about details of methodology and notes and, and getting bogged down in that, I'm happy to say don't take notes. There is a paper. So. Um, so I was able to publish this um, Six Critical Dimensions, a model for widening participation in open online and blended programs in AJET. And um, it probably came out pretty quietly on the 28th of December late last year when a lot of us were pretty tired and, and I haven't um, had an opportunity to do too much with that. So if you hadn't seen that one, it went under your radar. Um, yeah, the timing was a little tricky. So this paper exists and I will refer to it. And um, if you're interested in how, you know, the details of the findings there, you know, that's all open access. Um, some of you may be aware of the Computers and Education paper that was also published late last year, but it's been assigned 20 um, publication um, volume. And that was the Do MOOC Contribute to Student Equity and Social Inclusion, a Systematic Review. Now that paper um, I have had a lot of lovely feedback on and uh, it was a systematic review. It identified lots of cases and the paper, the conceptual model that I will share with you today is a second outcome from a second lot of data collection at the second phase of that same systematic review. So this has been a multi-phase long-term uh, research project. So um, yeah, so that's good. So moving on, yeah, so that model, um, if you look at the methodology in there, it's the critical dimensions, which I will share with you shortly, 
they are not good things or bad, not bad things or good things. They're just a dimension that has an influence on an outcome for a diverse student in online learning. So that model is based on the idea that each of those dimensions can both enable and constrain diverse learners in both distance and blended. So um, I may refer to that and hopefully that will become clearer as we move on. So it's it's not like a, a simplistic shopping list of stuff you've got to do. It's things to consider which can both enable and constrain. And I think this might um, resonate with people who've been involved with online learning for a long time. Some things that help some learners are not you know necessarily great for others so there is a juggle and some trade-offs and tensions but moving on um, in a nutshell five steps were, were taken to develop this new model and the first one is um, actually identifying an existing model so I actually have developed this from research that was done in the times of digital divides, earlier use of the internet, how to have equitable online participation. And this is the research of DiMaggio and Hagitai from 2001. And they identified five critical dimensions. And what I've done is added a sixth and um, brought them up to date for the current online widening participation uh, context. So step one started with the model. Those five dimensions were technology, autonomy, purpose, social support and skills. So I think the devil is in the detail of how that's defined and we will get to that. Um, as I mentioned, this was developed to explain equitable and inequitable use of online participation at a time when people were becoming increasingly aware that a digital divide model, a simply haves and have nots was not very um, useful. And in fact, there's a more nuanced way of talking about this in terms of digital equity. And this is where multiple dimensions come into play, hence these five critical dimensions that can influence the way that people uh, do or do not gain benefit from what is, you know, simply free and available to everyone online all the time. And so um, by adding the sixth dimension of learning materials, I was doing this because I needed to make a model that was specific to an educational setting, whereas the five original model um, dimensions were particular to the general use of the internet. And um, when I say learning materials, don't panic. I don't just mean stuff. I'm not talking about um, broadcasting just, you know, texts and videos and so on. I mean a very broad definition of learning materials that includes assessment, formative, summative, you know, feedback conversations a very broad conceptual conceptualization of learning materials. And indeed, um, steps one and two developed very specific definitions for each of those things that were really reflective of current literature from widening participation research related to digital divides and equitable online learning. The third step, I needed to test this and see if it was if it would fly for real. So in the first two steps, I've developed a conceptual from theory, from the existing literature, and the remaining steps was about seeing how it would work for real. So I wanted to know, were those dimensions actually having an impact in real online courses? And so I had to identify a bunch of cases that I could test them with, and that's where the systematic review came in. So once I'd identified those cases, I then collected a whole bunch of data about how those courses succeeded or didn't. And so there was a qualitative synthesis of those successful or unsuccessful designs um, in relation to um, if they discussed anything that met the definition of those six critical dimensions. So it was a really fascinating process and finding that many of these dimensions seem to have a very substantial impact, although some seem to be more substantially impacting than another. And so at the end of this huge exercise of qualitative synthesis of all of these cases, a comparison with the proposed model dimensions, I ended up with some revised definitions in the light of these actual real running cases that had been tested with diverse students and found to have um, a certain degree of success. 
So that's a lot to take in. Does anyone just want to give me a thumbs up? Are we traveling okay with this? Is it making sense? Can you hear me? Are we going good? Excellent. Yeehaw. I'm seeing so many thumbs up. I'm feeling very happy. Thanks, guys. Let's move on. Only a couple more slides before I start to ask for your feedback. All right, here it is. So um, the six critical dimensions for widening online participation, the version that I published in the AGET article uh, December last year. So you will see that uh, learner support and autonomy, the two biggish blue circles are fairly prominent and that is intentional because of these six critical dimensions, those two turned out to have more of an influence of the outcome. And when I say this, I mean if the course succeeded, they were more likely to be prominently considered. And if it if there were problems, if it if there were difficulties, these things also <laughs> were, were um, coming into play positively or negatively. So those things, um, the definitions of those things are very particular. So if we look at learner support, I'm talking about very broad, academic, motivational, technical support from teachers, yes, mentors, yes, peers, yes, and also pre-existing social networks who are not in the course, uh, or they may be, or they, but likely not be. So a very broad um, conceptualization of learner support. And I think when we think of online and blended, we think that we are only, you know, it's the, it's the students that, that have to do the peer-to-peer -peer stuff. And it's, you know, us as teachers, we have to be, you know, we have to do all of that sort of support and the, the staff and the university. And some, and of course, that's it's very important, but learners are also uh, relying on pre-existing social networks. And that uh, and that's really interesting to see who and how they blend together um, formal and informal forms of support. Autonomy, choice and control over learning, the when, the where, the how, sure, that's important. But also contributions were made without social pressure or role pressure. Students wanted to be able to learn uh, and apply that learning to their own, their own goals. So some sense of um, uh, it, it being they're driving their, their own um, their own race there, I suppose. And so on top of that, course purpose uh, was really important. So um, this was also much more specific in the successful courses. So yes, mastery, but of foundation topics, improving socioeconomic opportunities and enabling pre-existing groups to learn together. That was really unexpected, but relates to how much community there is in learning and um, and uh, and how much communities like to learn together. So it could be you know a whole a subsection of a, a school or teachers learning together using um, online programs, MOOCs or MOOC-like free courses. Learner skills, of course, is important, but what made a difference was scaffolded incremental development of both technical and also study skills. And yes, learning materials were important. And on the right, you can see. They liked a range of media, um, things needed to be open to translation in different languages, coherent sequences, choice, feedback, showcasing authentic and diverse expertise. And within all of that, there was a strong theme of recognising and empowering diversity. So those five dimensions, really powerful. But I did say six. And the sixth one is um, kind of small down the bottom, technology. And what was really quite astounding in the outcome of this research was how minimal that technology dimension played uh, in terms of making a difference to the success or, or otherwise. Now, it certainly was absolutely critical to make the course possible, don't get me wrong, having 24 seven access to an online course that's free, absolutely crucial starting point. But once that was happening, um, what was happening with the technology, the technology itself did not particularly enable or constrain unless there was a, pre a free provision of devices in the absence of all other options for dis disadvantaged students. But what the technology did was amplify the other dimensions and then it had quite, um, quite an important 
role to play. And so this notion of the interaction between the dimensions, there being a, an amplification component was something unexpected and interesting in the findings and in the logic of the model. So um, when I was first drawing this up at a high level model in actual fact, I drew it like this. Skills, materials, the purpose, the autonomy, the support, at the heart of it, a community of learners, um, a learners and at the heart of it, the objecting, uh, an objection around uh, inclusion and equity. And over all of that, I drew a watering can to represent the technology as something that is helping to grow all of those other dimensions. And certainly within the, um, the paper, there are some examples um, which I obviously can't go into with, with this session to get into that detail. You can see how each of these might, might um, go. But the cases that I tested with from the systematic review are global, blended, distance, global south, global north, different um, multilingual, multicultural, you know, different kinds of programs, but all of them shared a desire to assist damaged or non-privileged learners to provide and widen access to, um, to make a difference to students who have been previously excluded or marginalised in some way. And so um, I think this is um, a timely way to think about uh, how we can consider not only um, shaping our programs but how we also might like to research them. So that's the six critical dimensions and how how I got to it. Um, and I think the big question, you know, why bother? You know, why do we need another model? And what what I found at the beginning, and it sort of grew as I kept reading and looking and reading and looking, is I found that models for online and blended learning that we just don't seem to reflect the experience of diverse learners. And so I looked at the transaction assistance and the community of inquiry models because for good reason, <laughs> um, they have been very popular in research for a long time. Um, but I, I, I kept finding that they're primarily tested with postgraduate level learners. So not the kinds of learners that we are trying to widen access to in the undergraduate space, in the transition space, in um, the pathway space, in the um, widening access to people who don't have uh, already a good education, who don't already know how to do online learning. And so I just... I started to feel that we really, I mean, other researchers have already made the point in the literature that, that these models at 40 to 50 years old really need updating for contemporary online use and platforms. But I was also starting to think that I think they need updating also to make sure that they're tested with, used with, um, made um, meaning with. Uh, the experience of diverse undergraduate learners and foundation level learners. So in other words, what we call would call widening participation. So um, I do have some more comments on that, but I, you know, it's always so nerve wracking putting forward ideas like this. You feel like perhaps you just need to read another 100 papers and you'll, you know, you don't want to uh, critique a, a model wrong. But I really would like to, um, invite you now to either through making some comments in the text here or diving straight into the collaborative worksheet um, tinyurl.com slash ODL model. Um, I'm really wanting to see if anyone else has some examples that are in fact working well for the diversity or is this kind of a reasonable um, a reasonable judgment to make that it is in fact time for an upgrade to ODL theory for, for now when we have more diverse learners and we have such um, widespread use of the internet and mobile internet. So, um, so yes, please, I, you know, the questions that I'm interested to, to know is what models do you use in your research and practice? What are they good for? Are they particularly useful to diverse, diverse cohorts? 
if there's anyone who is a great proponent of both trans or either transactional distance theory or the community of inquiry model, but there's some stuff that I haven't read that they could give me a more balanced view of where it is working, I'm really open to that. And I'm also interested to hear from anyone who might be interested in collaborating further on the six critical dimensions, research and practice elements. So how would we like to, to um, take this next section, moderators? How much time have we got and would you like to do voice or how would we like to go? Hi Sarah, Maren here. Awesome presentation, thank you so much. Um, interesting. We are going to take questions in the chat and we have about five minutes. Cool, all right. So we can moderate together and my colleague Jane is at hand as well in case we get lots of questions. So people um, put up your questions and then we've got five more minutes, Sarah, before we hand over to Jim and Lauren. Does that sound okay? Cool, all right. While we're looking for, I'm getting some nice feedback. Um, I'm not yet seeing a question. So if I might put forward a little bit more of what I was concerned about with these models and we can pause this if anyone has a particular question. So um, with transactional distance theory, transactional for, for one is a, is a word that uh, has a particular well, you know, the banking approach to content-based learning and it sort of suggests that and distance is, is about distance education. But within this model, um, they in the TD model, learner difference is confined to the learner autonomy dimension, which is limited in its conceptualization of diversity to just independent versus dependent learners. And Gosh, that's not a lot um, to differentiate us diversity we have and how we think about learners. So independent versus dependent, I think I think we probably moved on quite a bit from that. And also studies to bring this model up to date with changes in contemporary web-based learning environments had limitations in that they are also examining privileged groups of learners, in particular grad students in business or ed courses at North American unis. So, I'm, you know, I'm looking to see that these are being taken up in, in um, more um, contemporary contents, uh, contexts with diversity, but I, I'm struggling so really keen for any links that people might have. And with the community of inquiry model, this one was um, really interesting too because there is quite a lot of research indicating that the dimensions of this model are not particularly um, repeatable and, and, and verifiable and people are often trying to, to change um, the definitions and add lots of other components to it because the original uh, presences, as they're called, um, didn't quite fit for, for circumstances. And so there's this really interesting paper on the nth the nth presence that Kazan and Cascoli talk about saying, look, wow, um, you know, if we keep adding more and more dimensions, we're, <laughs> we're, never, we're never going to stop. So maybe it's not quite right. But um, the thing that was super interesting also with this paper is they, they went back to what it this model is actually for it. It was never about evaluating a whole course. It was never evaluating um, and designing or considering the whole course. It was actually designed with the intention of um, investigating the de development of higher order learning and critical thinking skills through discussion based collaborative pedagogies, which is super specific and definitely not about widening participation of equity students in foundational undergrad studies. Mm -hmm. And I th I'm just concerned that um, taking that, you know, taking that model and applying it to whole courses in lots of different contexts is, um, is you know, how, how can we do that? So particularly this one has also been largely concentrated in studies towards graduate level you know, US courses on e-learning. Um, there's also been a lack of diversity in authors with this model and I don't want this happening for mine, which is why I'm opening up for participation right at the start. Um, Sarah, did you want to survey... give two questions before we finish? Oh, um, cool. Sorry to yes, interrupt yes. you. So we've got yeah, one now. from Francis Bell 
um, who is keen to learn more about um, the, sorry, just lost it, about different categorize learners rather than their behaviors that can change over time. And there's another yeah. question from Taskeen, um, who is also keen, maybe, maybe we can pick up those two before we finish, to hear more yeah. about the idea that the privileged will, um, like the idea of inequality and how you tackled that in your research. So um, that was the yeah, two questions so, so that we have. Tuskeen, for this particular slice, I only included the courses in the systematic review if they had an objective to um, widen participation, to increase student equity or social inclusion. So by, you know, that from the outset was all I was looking at in the courses that were included in the systematic review. So, um, so that that's how I did it there, um, and we can pick up offline some other other research methods. And I'm seeing from Daria about learning support. How important is it that these people are diverse too? Absolutely, teachers are not homogenous, and learners are not homogenous, and and um, people are at you know different spaces. And that was another thing uh, issue that I had about the the notion of presences in the community of inquiry model because. Presence is not always good, right? But this model assumes that you want more presence all the time. But we know in our studies of, um, you know, how re research into classes, sexist and racist encounters in online environments, that presence is not always fantastic. So that was another concern I had that we were making through this model and notion uh, embedded in it, the assumption that teachers are and students are all homogenous and we you know, they can only be, you know, they, they're either present or distant and that's the only variable. So that seems to me also to be um, just not, not quite right. So Amazing. yeah, Daria, great point, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, any final thoughts? Um, and um, obviously the recording of your presentation will be put onto the program page um, later today. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we hand over to Lauren and Jim? No, thanks so much. I will really look forward to going back over the comments, having a look at the um, the Google Doc, and that will be open for coming weeks. So don't feel to you know you have to to do that instantly if you want to participate. Just want to thank GOGN for their feedback throughout things as well, um, and give a plug to the upcoming Jime edition of Open Education and Social Justice that Laura and I have been working hard on. Um, and there's some beautiful papers uh, coming out through there that I will look forward to sharing with you. Um, slides have references and also um, some tech details. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming along.